So I just posted a picture of my breakfast earlier and I'm just checking to see how many likes I got. It's been over an hour and no likes and I'm kind of stressed out by that. <laughs> uh, do you ever wonder why that happens to us? I mean, we, we spend lots and lots of time on social media. We share our lives. We share everything that, that happens to us. And we crave the like. We crave the activity. We, we, we crave some kind of attention. And, and what we don't necessarily understand is, is that social media was designed that way. And, and while we may think that we have control over everything we do, we have control over our thoughts, over our moods, over every minute of our life, sometimes we just give that control away to somebody else. Um, with continuous exposure to a thing becomes continuous influence of that thing on our lives. And, and, and the thing is that, that we've got so much going on in our heads all of the time that our relationship with social media can, can at times really impact that. So what I wanna to talk to you today is mind control. So have you ever thought about perhaps somebody else controlling your mind? Because you see, the way, the way that our, our brains work is we've got a whole bunch of chemicals swirling around all the time. We've got dopamine and oxytocin and cortisol and, and a host of others. And, and as these chemicals swirl around in our brains, it changes the way we behave. And, and, and the thing is, as we interact with various tools in our life, various social media platforms, even various people, that brain chemistry then kind of starts to change. And, and we end up giving away a little bit of control. And, and we just don't even realize it. Now, in America, there's certainly a rise of, of what's called general anxiety disorder, also social anxiety, and there's a new one called pediatric anxiety, where doctors are prescribing heavy-duty medications to children so they can cope because their brain chemistry is being altered each and every day, and they don't even realize it. So... The thing about social media is, is, is it's, it's highly addictive. Why is it that I want people to like my picture of my breakfast? Why do I post pictures of my breakfast anyway? Again, because, because what I want to see is, 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 is I want to see that interaction and I like the feeling of those positive chemicals in my brain. I, I get a, a little excited when I put out a picture because I think, oh, my friends are really gonna like this. And then I wait for those likes to appear and I get a little dopamine hit every time one appears. And that makes me want to post something else so I can get some more likes. And that makes me want to post something else so I can even get some more likes. And, and the thing that happens is, is I get addicted to that dopamine hit. I get addicted to the fact that people are liking the things that I see. And, and dopamine is the same chemical that's responsible for people getting addicted to drugs and alcohol and a host of other things that we get addicted to in our lives. And it all has to do with the way these chemicals are released and processed within our minds. And we just give away control. And we don't even realize it. Uh, in fact, one of the founding developers from Instagram talked about this. And, and he said, look, there's always another hashtag. Instagram is bottomless. And you can chase Instagram you can chase hashtags, you can chase likes, and it becomes very, very, very addictive to your everyday life. And, and the thing is, Adam Alter in his book, Irresistible, talks about how that it's not necessarily our self-control that's the problem. The issue is that there's a thousand people on the other side of the screen whose job it is to break down our self-regulation. They know how these chemicals work. They know that we chase the likes. They, they know what makes us tick. And it's their entire job to keep us engaged. And so when Facebook introduced the like button, for instance, it changed the engagement of Facebook entirely. Because now you can very quickly tell people you approve of what they're saying. And now people could very quickly put something out and say, do you approve of what I'm saying? Please, please, waiting for my like. 
And, and, and so we get so addicted and, and we, we, we get so dependent on everything that we do on social media that, that it then starts to almost run our lives and we just give away control. So what I wanna do is, is I wanna talk about what we can do to take back some of that control. And I wanna use the acronym MIND, M-I-N-D, as an easy way for us to remember some of the tools, some of the techniques, and some of the things we can do to ensure that we're not allowing other people to control our minds. So let's start with M. M stands for mindset. Now, Carol Dweck has done some amazing work in the field of mindset, and she talks about what's called a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And, and for those uh, that, that don't know, so a fixed mindset says, look, I have a certain set of skills, I have a certain intelligence level, uh, I, I, have, I have a certain amount of stuff that I can use, and I have to operate my entire life within the boundaries of that stuff. And, and so if there's something that's difficult for me and I fail at it, that's okay because I just don't quite have the skills or the intelligence or the stuff. Now a growth mindset on the other hand, a growth mindset says, do you know what? You can learn how to do anything you wanna do. A growth mindset says, no, our, in fact, our IQs aren't fixed. Our skill sets aren't fixed. And with some training and some practice and some trial and error, we can learn to do all sorts of things. And then all of a sudden, failure doesn't become failure. Failure becomes learning. And it changes entirely. Um, now, Jessica Slater did some other really interesting research where she took these concepts and she applied them to mental health. And, and this got really exciting because now when we look at these same fixed and growth mindsets with a view to mental health, then we find that the people that have a growth mindset have a very different reaction to mental health issues. In fact, she found that 58% of her subjects that were identified with a fixed mindset had issues with things like anxiety, stress, anger, compared to those with a growth mindset. That's huge. So, so all of a sudden, what, what happens is, is when we are in a fixed mindset, we may be a bit more susceptible to this mind control. Because what happens is, is my fixed mindset says, oh, I, I'm really stressed out because nobody has given me any likes for my picture of my breakfast, and, and so um, I just need to stay stressed out because um, people don't like me anymore. And then we develop these talk tracks that go on in our head, and these talk tracks are very fixed mindset talk tracks. And it, you know, it's, it's a little man or woman in your head that's, that's got you know, a, a label maker in one hand and a bullhorn in the other, labeling everything you do and then screaming out and telling you all about it. And, and, and we allow our mindsets to then dictate what our internal talk tracks are. So how do we take control of that? So if we look at I in mind, I stands for identify. And so we want to identify the source and we want to identify the impact of the things in our daily life. What is the source of, of, of me feeling a bit stressed because I don't have likes on my breakfast? What's the impact of that on me throughout the day? Um, and, and, and so as I start to develop these internal talk tracks, they can be really, really detrimental. So let me give you a practical example. A number of years ago, I had quite a successful career as a boxing and mis mixed martial arts ring announcer. So I was the one in the center of the ring with a tuxedo on in the red corner, in the blue corner. Right? And, and, and I had a great career, and I, I worked all over the world. I worked all up and down the country in the UK. I worked in Ireland. I worked in Switzerland. I worked in Amman, Jordan. And, and, and I was quite in demand, first of all, because I have an American accent and boxing promoters like that from the center of the ring. And also because I did things a bit differently. I wore very sparkly jackets. I wore gold sequin jackets and sparkly boots, so much so that, that they nicknamed me Hollywood. <laughs> so I got a call one day from Matchroom and they said, hey, we've got the Champion of Champions snooker tourn tournament coming up. Would you like to come and host it? I thought, oh, I don't know anything about snooker. Never watched snooker, never played snooker. Growth mindset, yeah, I'll do it. Excellent, I can't wait. And it was to be televised live on ITV 
twice a day for five days in a row. I was going out on ESPN in America. I was going out in all sorts of other countries. And it was kind of a big deal. And I was really, really excited to do it. And, and so I, I turned up on the first day of the five-day engagement in my sparkly jacket and my sparkly boots, like the boxing ring announcer that I was. And as the camera started to roll and I got ready to announce the first players, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the arena. Here comes Ronnie the Rocket. Oh, Sullivan! <laughs> the crowd applauded, and, and Ronnie came into the, into the arena, and his opponent came into the arena, and we started to play. And, and so as we started moving through the day, I then made the mistake of looking at my social media feed. And what I discovered is that snooker fans don't necessarily like sparkly jackets. <laughs> Snooker fans don't like American accents. And the comments and things that came through my Twitter feed, there's no place for an American in snooker. This guy's the worst MC ever. Total silence would be better than him. And it just went on and on and on. This was day one, session one, of a five-day engagement where I was on live international TV twice a day. Now, as my internal talk track started to roll in my head, the next time I came out to the arena, I wasn't quite so confident. Because I knew that, that you know, there, there was people out there that, that didn't like me. I wasn't getting any likes on my breakfast. And, and so, and so it, it took me a while, and, and I, I actually happened to also um, be reading at the same time uh, a book by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. He says you can take everything away from a man except for his ability to choose his attitude in any given circumstance. Wow. It hit me like a ton of bricks and, and changed my whole outlook. And all of a sudden, I thought, right, so now I can start to identify the source and identify the impact it's having on me. Now I can choose my mindset. I can choose how I'm gonna react. I can choose my attitude in this given set of circumstances. And, and it was a big deal. It really, really changed everything for me. And, and so back to the likes on Facebook and back to the activity on Facebook, it's very much the same, right? Because, because I, I see interaction and I want likes on my breakfast. Um, we all tend to give away a little bit of control, as I said, without us even knowing. Do you remember Cambridge Analytica not too, young, not too long ago? Right? And, 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 so, and, the, and the new buttons that came on Facebook, so now you could like something, you could dislike it, you could be angry with it, you could laugh at it, you could say, wow, it could make you sad. And now all of this data and all of the information that you are giving, you have a targeted ad in front of you, you decide you want to agree with it, and now that data is fed somewhere else, and one of those thousand people behind the screen can put another targeted ad in front of you, and they can start enforcing your cognitive biases. They can start enforcing and reinforcing your opinions. They could even start to change your opinions, right? And, and, and all of those quizzes that we all took, I, I can guess your age in three questions. Or which celebrity do you look like? Because I wanted to know whether I looked more like Brad Pitt <laughs> or Pothethwaite. Right? And, and so we all did that. And all of this stuff that comes in, and then, there's, and then there's facial recognition, and then there's data collection, and then they use that data, mine that data, to start to change opinions. And even before that, when Donald Trump was running for president, there was Project Alamo. Look that one up. That will blow your mind. Very much the same thing. And, and so we just tend to give away control because we don't identify the influences and the impacts of what the things that we're interacting with have on us every day. So the N in mind stands for note our reaction and note our response. Again, as we, as we think about what responses do we have to the things that go on in our news feeds, for instance. I mean, let's face it, we all, we all kind of live in a, in a news feed bubble on social media because we, we are friends with people that are like-minded to us. We have social circles of people that are like-minded to us. Most people now get their news from their social media feeds. And you're rarely gonna see anything that challenges your thought because everybody you're friends with is just like you. 
And, and sometimes when these organizations and these thousands of people behind your computer screens get involved and start to understand how your brain chemistry works, they could even start to change the opinions of your whole group. And then your biases just go a different way. And we give up control and we don't even understand it. I mean, we, have, we have reactions to all kinds of stimuli in our life. Some things make us happy, some things make us sad. And, and the thing is, is, is we develop memories and we develop uh, all of these cognitive connections and, and these, these, this neural circuitry in our brain. And what happens is we develop habits. So my habit when I post a picture of my breakfast is, is to, to check a thousand times to see when I have a like. And, and we all love the noise that our phone makes, right? Bing, oh, 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 somebody wants to talk to me. That's great, right? Or, or how about, have you ever been in a shop and somebody in the other aisle, their phone rings, it's not even your ringtone, but you still pick up your phone just, just to check, right? And, and so, so we, we, we get these habits. And, and the thing is that as, as, we, as we develop these habits and we develop the, this neural circuitry, then we can very easily be led and we can very easily move in, in any direction that people with this knowledge want to take us into. And, and so, how do we change all of this? How do we change um, our reactions? Because social media, let's face it, it's not going anywhere. We're only gonna become more dependent on it as the years go on. It's only gonna, gonna become more invasive, right? When Facebook first came out, it was really fun. Again, in the book Influence, uh, he says that now it's a weaponized version of itself. And it's true. And we just expose ourselves to it and we allow to be influenced. So, so as we start to identify what's going on, as we start to get the right mindset, as we start to identify the impact and the source of that information, as we start to note our reactions, that then all of a sudden we can start to take a little bit of control back. And finally, we can then determine our action. Because I'm the one that's in control of my mind. Because I'm the one that's gonna be in control of my interactions with social media. And I'm the one that's gonna be in control of how I react to these things. And, you know, what about my breakfast? <laughs> On second thought, it doesn't really matter because I am the one in control. Thank you.